Um, so today I'm going to talk about a model, well, in the context of my PhD, so I explain a little bit what the model does. Um, it's called MESA. Um, I've, I've realized you need to have a good name for a model. <laughs> so I gave it a good name, which I thought was good. It's a model of energy saving actions in the households. Um, so the context of my work is uh, one of energy security. Um, um, the background is that I was interested to know what to do if there was shortages of um, energy, alternative ways to deal with shortages of energy. That was my um, interest. So I won't talk about that too much. But um, just to say, the context I'm looking at is a context where we have in the UK a shortage of gas. Um, and I'm looking at a situation where um, the government or um, authorities ask people to save energy in their homes in order to counteract the, um, the energy supply issue. Um, it's not something which is in completely unlikely to happen. Obviously, there's um, quite a lot of media talk about potential problems with gas supplies. This is something which is from last month's um, where um, there was, this is uh, from the Guardian, online Guardian, where um, there was sort of suggestion that gas supply would be exhausted and that prices would go up. So the idea to use people um, to save energy when there's a shortage is not something new. Um, I've presented it before, but this is a poster from um, wartime where uh, <laughs> people were asked to save energy <laughs> and the wife was kind of the electricity. Um, and so this is something a little bit more recent. This is in Japan, an example here, you know, after the um, nuclear catastrophe in Japan, people were asked to, um, to reduce their electricity consumption. And, and this is another uh, poster which is being used for that purpose. It's quite an effective way to, re to sort of uh, mitigate energy crisis. This is from a paper from Alan Meyer, who's the main uh, sort of researcher in that area and he was this is quite old it's from 2006 so it doesn't include um, the recent case of Chapman but um, it's looking at the energy savings that have been achieved purely through people in households and businesses of course um, saving energy so you know in Brazil here it's up to 20% um, the reason why they achieve so much there is because they were punished if they didn't save energy <laughs> like big fines um, so my, this is my PhD question. Can an energy shortage be effectively mitigated through rapid energy savings in households using London as a case study? This is really um, my question. Uh, so it's a quantification issue. I'm actually looking at a number here. Um, and so it's not really a, a study of you know, how media effective are effective to do this kind of thing. It's purely a quantification <coughs> exercise. I'm trying to calculate the potential energy savings in households through um, energy saving actions, which would be impl implemented in the context of a shortage. So I'm using um, for this the case of one month. So um, I'm asking people to save energy for only a month and see what happens. So in order to do that, I've done a survey. This is my um, sample for the survey. It's a May survey. It's a probability sample, which has been randomly um, selected through a stratified um, method. And the survey um, is, is, is a May survey asking, with a questionnaire asking about uh, dwelling properties first, um, sort of thermal properties, size, etc. There's questions about the people, how many of you they are, uh, how old, uh, what do you do? Well, these kind of questions. What do you think about saving energy at home? So these are questions about the people. And then I have the specific uh, energy action saving questions. So, um, so there are questions which relate to um, uh, sort of specific things. So, um, you know, do you normally set your temperature, your thermostat one degree centigrade lower, or would you? And would you do this in a, in the context of a shortage? So there's a little introduction. Um, introducing uh, what the shortage would be, and then specific actions, a list of 25 specific actions, asking, do you do this normally? Would you do this in the context of a crisis? And um, from that, I'm, trying, I'm evaluating the difference to, between what happens normally in terms of energy saving actions and what would happen if uh, they did implement the things that they say <laughs> in the context of a shortage. So I'm, I'm looking at that difference here. 
Um, I'm aware that um, there are differences between what people say they do and uh, what they really do. Um, so I'm really um, establishing a potential there of energy saving rather than actual energy saving. So that's very important. Um, these are the responses from the survey. So these are all the actions here. Um, there's a long list of them. And the green things is the percentage um, of people that say they normally implement in this action. Um, the blue thing are uh, the actions that people say they'd implement in the context of a shortage. And the red thing is um, the number of people that say they never implement this, whatever happens. So just, there are things which are not completely, you know, uh, oops, this is strange. Well, um, so this is a, the most, I think, uh, prominent thing. There's um, sort of over 65% of people that's, that say they normally don't heat only one room in their house, home, but they would in the context of a shortage. Mm. That's quite an extreme measure, and it's the most effective measure. you see that later after when I show you the results from the model. It's the most effective measure. Loads of people are saying they do that, and there's a lot of people that say they only heat the rooms which they use in their home. Uh, so these are very um, effective and, and uh, measures which have been um, uptake from taken on very much. Um, then there's other really odd things which come up. Um, whoops, I've got problems with my arrows. Here, um, these are the people that say they would wash all their houses ha clothes by hand. So I'm a bit worried about this. I mean, about 50% of the respondents are men that probably never wash all <laughs> <but> clothes <laughs> by hand. I've got no idea. But this shows the, I, I, I don't know whether this is realistic, you see, because I don't know whether once you try to implement this, you'd actually do it. Because the reality of doing this is that it's, it's, it's very, so this is an interesting um, health check, which didn't come out really well. Um, and the other interesting thing that came out, the, the action which is um, <laughs> taken the last is not using a kettle. Mm. It shows that British people are quite okay with not heating the house, but they're definitely going to have a tea, <laughs> whatever happens. <laughs> so, um, quite a few yeah. odd things coming up. But, um, so, the model, what the model does, it takes the data from the survey. So, I've got about 500 homes. Um, which have responded. This is a 30% response rate, and I'll talk about normal response in a mi minute as well. Um, so it takes, it takes all the survey data, and then for each of these households, it models um, the energy used in three situations. The base case, which takes sort of a, um, a sort of average situation and um, thermostat setting of 21 degrees centigrade, etc. And then it, ca it, takes, it calculates as a sort of as usual energy use, which takes into account the as usual measures which are being taken in houses. And the third energy use is the one which is in the situation of a shortage. So it takes calculate three different energy use for each of these households. And then from that I have energy savings in kilowatt hours or in percents of the initial energy use. So this is the more complicated uh, version of that. This is my I call this my PhD roadmap, <laughs> but um, really um, we've got the survey here coming again. You know, um, I have my model, mes which I call Mesa. Um, I fed in, and I talk again about this in a minute. I fed in some information, um, which is from a practice. So I call it my practice review, but it's a review of social practice in relation to each different energy saving action what people normally do in their house with their thermostats mm -hmm. and how that would impact the, um, how easy it is to actually implement the action. And so I've, um, I've done a lot of that as well. I'll talk about this. Now I'm doing a little bit of stats and some weighting and things and my results come out of the, the whole thing. Um, so what is MESA? Um, it's based on the Breeden and SAPT algorithms, which I'm still not sure whether they're the best thing ever, um, but it's what's normally done. Um, and also, it has a benefit. The algorithms are there. They're easy to review, understand. There's a lot of documentation about them. So there's a lot of benefit in using these, these algorithms. Um, the, there is a geometry model which <coughs> I've made from a linear regression using the English housing survey. Um, because when I... My question had to be really short so that I get a good response rate. It had to be super short. 
And things people don't like to answer is, um, what is the floor area of your property? Mostly they don't have any idea. They kind of tell you how many rooms they have. Um, so this is what I've asked. I've asked, how many rooms do you have? And because I didn't have the floor area, I had to calculate it somehow. So in order to do that, I've taken another database, which is the English Housing Database, which is quite big, and gave me quite good uh, regression models of things like total floor area, internal volume, and external wall area. So uh, that's what I've used for that. I've also used, um, I've kind of made a little um, a model of um, appliance, appliance energy use. And that's based on also measured data on different appliances. Uh, <coughs> so the, in that case, the energy use of different appliances depends on the months. It varies depending on the months. You know, for example, we know that um, the use of dryers uh, varies from month to month. So um, it depends on the type of households. By that, I mean not the dwelling type, but the type of occupants you have. You know, if you have uh, a single retired person, they behave in slightly different way than if you have loads of um, um, don't know, students sharing together. So um, this, is a, this is also an important parameter and of course the number of occupants. <coughs> Um, and very important, um, one of the important parameters which I'm using in MESA is the impact of energy saving action. So I have modified um, the DBREDEM algorithm <coughs> to be able to integrate those. I've added my own algorithms in there as well. Um, and these are all the impact of energy saving action is all governed by uh, what I call the ESA factors, energy saving action factors. Um, these are parameters which are generally expressed. Um, whoops, I'm going to actually go straight to the other factors because that makes more sense. Um, they're expressed in a percentage of savings um, on, on a base energy use. So generally they don't know that. Not always, but generally that's what they are. So they're going to be the percentage of uh, energy saving from the energy use of your washing machine. So for example, so if you lower the temperature of your washing machine to 30 degrees every time, 30 degrees centigrade every time you do a wash, there's a percentage of energy saving and this is what it is. So that this is the ESA factor. In some cases, I've used different units. Very importantly, I've used different units when it comes to reduction of temperatures um, in, the, in the living place. So heating controls are expressed in degrees centigrade. Um, it made a lot more sense to have an ESA factor which related directly to the control of the heating system there because the percentage in itself would change depending on the type of dwelling very much. Um, and because these particular things are very important, they, these particular um, ESA factors are very important and, and have a lot of impact and I've, I've taken a degree centigrade as a, as a, as a measure. Um, when the spaces are left unheated, um, and this is one of the main things which um, it would be good to have some feedback on. <laughs> um, I've decided to um, reduce the temperature in unheated space spaces. So I'm not assuming that unheated spaces are left at the external temperature because I don't think that's realistic. The average um, external temperature <coughs> in London, according to Breedon, um, during the month of January, which is the case I'm taking, the worst case scenario, is 3 degrees 0 0.6 centigrade. That's not realistic. So what I've done, um, because things I've read about console, as I have decided on a, um, a reduction in internal temperature for these rooms, which I, I've decided is five degrees centigrade. But you see some, some more about this later. In some other cases, these are factors relate to things like um, in, uh, water, domestic whole water <coughs> saving, uh, which also start made more sense because I had a model to calculate this in more detail. So MESA um, has an input of survey data, ESA factors, loads of assumptions, loads of them coming from RD, SAP, um, other assumptions that had to be ma made. So these I can I'll still consider like input because I can change them. Um, and output is energy use in three scenarios, as I said earlier. For each dwellings, um, then there's weighted totals. I'll talk about how I've done that later. Um, I can also do a variety of sensitivity analysis um, on using META. So in order to quantify my energy saving factors, um, I've done a practice review. So I first start, what is it that I need 
in order to in order to know um, how much can be saved through uh, turning your uh, washing machine down by a notch or something like that. Um, so I needed to know about what people do with their washing machines on a daily basis, in average, what are the, the general temperatures at which they set, what kind of settings they have on their temperature, um, is it acceptable for them to change the temperature of their washing machine, this kind of information I needed to be able to understand um, whether it be implemented totally, the actions would be implemented totally. Um, so this is, this is why I've done a practice review. Um, and this is the process I went through. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples to see, demonstrate how people are bloody complicated. Um, so it, it was all clear in my head until I started doing this, uh, and it just went mad. Um, so I'm going to take two examples, which are examples which are particularly annoying, um, just, just to, go, to talk about this. So watching television is one of them. So one of the things I found uh, watching television is that people watch a lot of television, that's increasing. Um, it's a more and more cellularized activity, meaning it's not something which happens um, you know, as a group activity, everybody's got their TV. There's as many televisions in the UK as people, and that includes babies. Mm. So it's, it's quite, you know, um, what that means is that if the head of the, of the household, if there's such a thing, decides to, that everybody is not going to watch TV anymore, it's not going to happen. Um, you know, it's a cellularized activity. So, um, there's a wide range of ancillary devices. You don't have just the TV, you have loads of stuff which is plugged in, DVD players, uh, boxes, all sorts of things which are plugged in to the, with the TV and work with the TV. Um, there's a wide range of televisions, they all have very different um, energy consumption, um, they vary in size. Um, um, the other thing which is quite confusing is that there's a blurred line between um, watching television and surfing YouTube on internet and uh, watching the projector. So actually watching television doesn't have anything to do with the device television anymore, mm -hmm. which I didn't plan for that when I started, when I asked questions, I really watch television one hour, um, you know, instead of what you're watching normally. So what you're watching normally, so I didn't realize actually especially um, the younger part of the population, has a very different concept of what television watching means. And they watch television on computers mostly. Um, the other particular issue is that people don't really know uh, what is switched on, off, around their television. They make assumptions that if you just um, you know, go and switch on the control, then it's going to switch, switch everything off, which it doesn't. Sometimes they think you actually, if you switch it on the switch thing, you switch it off, which it also doesn't sit stand by very often. So there's loads of problems. And, and, and understanding all these things, uh, or not understanding them, <laughs> or getting a better idea of them, um, uh, sort of made me realize what difficult it is to make an accurate estimate as to what, in terms of energy uh, consumption reduction, would happen you know, if, if you reduce your. Because the, there's a variety of behaviors around that that could happen. The other thing is that you know, there's people that try to monitor um, energy use from different uh, devices and don't look at the numbers are just the number of devices which have been monitored here in this particular survey. Uh, but <coughs> you can see the point is the average, is the mean, and this is the kind of range of um, consumption, annual consumption for a particular device. So it's, it's very spread here. Um, and you know this is a, another um, another study, and they're looking at. I was looking here, trying to estimate how many hours people watch TV in average. I mean, this is um, how much the devices are on in average per day, considering the amount of televisions we have. This is unbelievable. I can't believe how much television people watch. But the the interesting thing though is. Um, the television in itself is on for four to five hours, depending on what television they are. But there's another notion of an audiovisual site, which is the whole thing, um, which includes all the ancillary devices connected to your television. And that is supposedly on for eight hours. And the reason is because mm -hmm. loads of the machines are on standby. And when the people from Intertech have done this calculation um, to estimate um, the average, average number of hours on, have um, sort of taken into account, have made a sort of um, uh, weighted average to estimate how many hours 
everything is on because um, a site is, is constituted of a, a number of machines. So there's not really a clear idea of, of how many hours the whole thing is on. So the consequence for this is that I've got issues of uncertainty in terms of number. Um, so because I don't know what is on, what is off, actual conf consumption, there's a variety of devices. There's also what I call issues of ambiguity, where people don't really understand the, you know, watching televisions for one hour a day rather than what you normally watch in the same way that I might have assumed they would initially. So there might be different understandings between people as well in this particular uh, sentence. Um, and then there's implementation issues where um, actually, will people actually do it? Because um, there's, well, in, there's issues of cellularization where maybe the head of the family that might have answered my survey, I don't know, has decided something, but because there's TVs all around the house, will it be actually implemented properly? I don't know. Um, and there's, of course, a standby issue where they might actually still leave it on. Um, I'm going to go through this one quickly. Another example, cooking, um, using the right size hob and the lid. I'm trying to <coughs> estimate the savings from just using the right size hob and the lid. It's not much, I can tell you that from the start. Um, what I found is enormous variations in food cooking habits. Um, there's relationships in how people use the items, you know, sometimes people use a kettle to preheat the water, things like that, so it's not just uh, using a pan. Um, it's really about lifetime, people don't care about energy when they cook at all, they don't think about it. Um, there's a variety of ancillary cooking devices. Um, we have a number of things in kitchens nowadays, it's not just um, an oven and cooker. Um, there's variations for the same meal, um, cooking the same meal, people will use a completely different amount of energy. And lots of people actually think they're using the right size hob and lid. So there's somebody that did their PhD about um, cooking a pack of instant noodles, <laughs> which I thought was really interesting. And, <laughs> and this is the researcher that, um, you know, optimized the amount of energy in cooking the, the pack of instant noodles. And these are all the participants and how much energy they've used. So what this shows is the variety of energy used for exactly the same activity. And also, um, you know, how some people can use quite a lot more energy than um, what is considered to be energy efficient without being uh, any aware of it. Um, there's also researchers that have been evaluating, actually, how much, I was really glad to find that, how much energy you can save through cooking with a lid and idle pot in, you know, in relation to not. Um, but I found that um, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of um, variation between the two. Um, so it's, it's uh, between um, estimates, but depending on the kind of food. So it varies here between 31 and 63%. So what does that mean in terms of my estimate? How do I, how do I, you know, I've got very really large error margins here. Um, so again, I've got issues of uncertainty, ambiguity. Do people actually understand what it means by using the right size hob and the uh, and, uh, and, uh, top on their pots? And issues of implementation, will they actually do it? So these are my problems uh, when, when doing this. And I've tried to tackle it um, by um, using uh, error margins around my ASA factors and also I've attempted in one case to use what I call, um, I've attempted to do a sensitivity analysis using, uh, using an implementation factor, which is a percentage of household actually implementing the action in real life. Um, so these are the two things I've done. Um, and you see what happens when I, I use these margins. Um, so I'm going to show you the results from uh, MESA now, and I'll show you the variations um, from my, um, between the results when I use these error margins. Um, so here we've got the, the results coming you know, from my base case scenario, uh, between my base case scenario, uh, sorry, I can't talk anymore. <laughs> um, the results are in terms of savings. You've got here, um, the situation in the shortage, the scenario of shortage and energy use. And here you've got um, the as usual energy consumption. And this is my base case, which I mentioned earlier, which I, which without any energy saving action at all. Uh, the saving is enormous, 30% uh, 
of uh, the as usual scenario, three energy saving actions. And you can see here that um, electricity saving um, is about 30% as well. There's a lot of difference between my monthly electricity use and gas use. Sorry. Yeah. Um, are they units kilowatts? Kilowatt hours. Kilowatt hours per yeah. month. For one month. In January. No? So does that mean under the shortage scenario they they will use more energy per dwelling? No, or sorry. Is that the this is the energy used in the situation of a shortage, so they're using one thousand seven hundred Oh, okay, yeah, so, so they're, they're separate. In, in the, yeah, yeah, as usual a bit. Right, okay, Does perfect. that all make sense? Yes, yes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in order to make my life easier, I've devised a new unit that didn't exist before, which I call the gas equivalent. Um, the, the gas equivalent is like a, a combination of the gas consumption and the amount of gas which typically is used um, to produce electricity in the UK. So this is not 100% right, but in the concept of a shortage, because in the context of a shortage, you might have a different amount of gas being used. But it's, it's a useful um, unit of measure for me, so I've used that. Um, so it's about 32%, 30%. This is the results that they come out. Now, I've been insanely lucky, because this actually happened once I put all my input and did all the corrections, eventually, I found that my, I did the annual energy consumption, because my model does calculations for every month. Um, I'm just using the January consumption for my um, research, but th there's a calculation for every month. And when I add it up for uh, my case, which is here, as usual scenario, it happens to be within 5% of deck values for London. Yeah, but that's just pure luck, I think, because the reality is, there are so many uh, assumptions in, this, in, in the model that I'd be really, um, I, th I think it's, it's in incredible. But, <laughs> and you see why as well, there's, there's you know, quite a lot of sensitivity to a number of factors. Um, this is the results, as I said, you know, the calculation is done for each dwelling in my sample, so there's 500 of them. So um, I've got a distribution um, coming out of the model this is a distribution I have in terms of monthly energy saving in gas equivalent, which is this new unit I've devised. Here I've got um, a, a strong outlier. So I've looked at what happens here. This is a 14 bedrooms, uninsulated house, um, where uh, the, the person living there, the gentleman living there, uh, is implementing all these energy saving actions possible. Um, so this is what happens, he's eating only one room in this massive 14 bedroom house and I've got this outlier. So I don't really know what to do with this, this thing because it really is out of um, everything else. Um, it's really, um, but in a way it's a case that exists. So I can't really neglect it. So I decided to leave it in because it, it exists. So yeah. Um, so this is, um, oh yeah, in order to understand what kind of weight I should use, I've used my data and I've done um, a number of statistical tests. Um, and what I've found is that um, the most important determinant of, um, of the energy savings in terms of gas equivalent was the number of rooms. It wasn't anything else. It wasn't the age of the occupants. It wasn't uh, whether the respondent was female or male, it wasn't the occupation, it wasn't anything else. The number of rooms was a stronger predictor. Um, it gives me um, a, a sort of R2 of 0.41 and regu reg regression coefficient uh, calculation, but you could, I don't think you can use the uh, linear regression for any other purpose because of course, my sample it doesn't have the properties which are necessary to normally do a, a regression um, analysis. I've just used this in order to determine which was a stronger predictor, so I could use it as a, as a, as a weighting factor. So I've used, subsequently, I've used a number of rooms as a weighting factor, and I've weighted my whole sample um, using that. 
Now, this also indicates me roughly whether the weighting factor is going to be a useful way to correct my data. Um, and I'd say it's moderately useful. You know, if I had an R2 of 80%, it means that the number of women is a very strong predictor of energy saving. Um, and, and then I could actually uh, weight very confidently and know that I correct my data properly. It does okay, but it's not amazing. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, non response briefly. The reason why I've weighted my data is because there's a lot of people that didn't, didn't answer. I don't know if you remember, I said only 30% of the people um, to whom I sent the survey actually answered. So there's a big bunch of 70% that are not answering. And what I'm really concerned about is that the 30% of the, that have answered are the people that are the most compliant. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they're the people that are most likely to say, yes, I'm going to save a lot of energy if you ask me to. So that's a bit of a problem. Um, and in order to kind of get a good idea of, I wanted to try to estimate what it is that happens to the other bunch, I've made a, so, so something that you can do. I've decided that there was 70% was a non-respondent bunch. And I've done a survey on the non-respondent bunch. Um, by that point, I kind of run out of money. I don't know if you've ever tried to do survey, but it costs a lot of money. So I kind of <laughs> run out of money. So I can only send um, the survey to, the, to 20 people. Um, and also because I send them um, a Tesco vouchers uh, for five quid um, each. So that was, you know, uh, only 20. Uh, no, I didn't send it, sorry. I sent it to 50 people. So I only got 20 pe people um, responding. So I only had 20 responses which is kind of good, is 40% of the non-respondent are responding. And then um, I put that through my MESA, through my model, got the energy saving they do, and what happened is that um, obviously because of the very small size of my sample, I can't find any statistical significance in the difference between the two. So they found to save a little bit less energy than um, the main survey bunch, 28% instead of 32, it's not a very big difference, but um, which I haven't written here. Uh, one ten trend is that these people also have, tend to have smaller rooms and smaller houses, sorry, with less rooms, and therefore the absolute energy saving is less in average. Mm -hmm. uh, but that no, none of that is found to be statistically significant, and I think it's just because my sample is so tiny and the difference you know, in relation to that. No. So if I had a lot of money in my PhD, <laughs> I would have sent it to loads of people, but it wasn't possible to, to, to do that, unfortunately. I think it'd be interesting to do more work on that. But, um, and these are the results. I've done a, a, a little calculation, which is taking each energy saving action independently of all the others, because um, the model, of course, would normally take into account the um, relationship between the different um, energy saving actions. So um, it calculates the energy use as a whole, taking into account everything that happens. So say if you reduce um, the um, energy use of your washing machine, then you reduce the amount of internal heat gains, which will increase the, um, the heat inside the the heat demand inside the dwelling. So there's relationship between them. Um, this is a, a kind of a simulation saying just using one of the, um, each of the energy saving actions separately. And it's taking into account how much people have actually um, implement, have said that they'd implement this action. So this takes into account two things, how much the uh, energy saving action will save and the amount of, um, I don't actually, I should have a good word for this, intake of this energy saving action, how much people have actually um, decided to implement it, the amount of implementation. Um, this is assuming that what people say they do, they actually do in this case. Yeah? Um, what is absolutely astonishing here is the difference um, in the different energy saving action, how much impact they have. Um, and I'm, I've been trying to decide whether that comes from um, the way the boat model works and the way breedem works. Um, but um, I think it's actually probably quite realistic because 
um, if you got um, this action, which is heat only one room in my home, we have a number, average number of rooms of about four to five, which is um, corresponding to the average in London. So I've taken actual values. Remember, it's weighted. Um, if you have a very large part of the house which is only, uh, which is not not heated, then we reducing result in a very um, high um, energy saving. The other thing is that this particular energy saving action was taken up by uh, by uh, about 65 percent of people. So this is one of the actions which is the most adopted and also the most effective. So as a result, you have a very long line here. Um, I haven't said, of course, um, in red here you have gas savings, in blue you have electricity savings, and in green you have gas equivalent savings, which is this dodgy unit that I was talking about. Um, and for example, here if people stop using um, lighting and use candles, I mean, I've of course uh, use the factors, I've not assumed that there's no lighting at all when I've taken this assumption, but um, you have an energy saving which is in terms of electricity, and, but um, you have a higher gas consumption because there's no uh, gains inside the house from the lighting anymore. Does that make sense? No. Sorry, I'm speaking French. No, no, I, I understand what you're saying. It just doesn't make sense mm -hmm. technically. Yes, if you... Because the candles throw off heat as well. Uh, yeah, you're right, actually. In fact, they probably throw off more useful heat because the candles are going to be close to you and the lights are usually thrown off heat where it's not used for that. That's part of the problem in the SAP breeder model, that it's, it assumes the games are useful and most of the time they're not. Mm -hmm. But actually all of the energy from the candles, and candles are very inefficient, which means you've got much more heat per unit light mm -hmm. than you have from electricity. But it, it's such a small number, don't worry no, about no, it. No, no, but it is. But, but do, yeah, do correct it for your thing. Yeah, thing. correct this, actually. Yeah. And, and, and just on the same line, the uh, what's the wattage of the bulb? Pardon? The bulb, the lighting. Uh, in the same line that... Uh, what I've done here, I've assumed... Um, I've, it's, I haven't really assumed a wattage of bulb. What I've done is, I've used a study which uh, devised the typical saving mm. that you get in UK households through uh, changing all light... I'm uh, oh, sorry, not in this case. No, in this case, I've, I've used the um, typical um, lighting energy use from the Bidem, Bidem mm. uh, model. And I've reduced that by a certain percentage. I've assumed that people still use lighting occasionally. Mm. Um, so this is what I've used there. I've just used the algorithm that's in Breeden. Mm. So I haven't used the wattage of ball because I haven't assumed a number of hours that the lighting was on. It's just the normal algorithm from Breeden, which takes into account things like occupancy, for example. Mm. Um, but yeah, what I was uh, referring to just a minute ago was the saving from changing all the lights to energy um, saving bulbs. I've, I've taken an existing research on how much savings it achieved. But that's a very good thank you, because I actually didn't see that. I don't think it's happening anywhere else, that, um, where I've ignored... Never use a kettle. Kind of yeah. well, again, might be incidental. Uh, never use a kettle. I've actually, in the survey, it says never use a kettle to stop di drinking tea in brackets. So, because the idea was that, so just, just to see whether, I mean, loads of these things were actually health checks yeah, sure. to see what people yeah. would say. I think these um, are small, small numbers, but I, I guess some of the negative gas savings mm. are incidental gains that. That's may, the games from that may or may not be actual well, real games. If you, if you tell him, because I, I'd be interested in that, if you say, Telling me that, um, because I haven't looked into this, Breedon doesn't accurately take into account the internal gains. Well, there's, there's a, there's a big question about whether they're genuinely useful yeah, gains. So so the the, the fridge heats the wall behind the fridge. <laughs> yeah. Now that's, that's generally not a useful gain. <laughs> yeah. um, a, a ceiling rose with a light in it will heat the ceiling rose. Yeah. Again, probably not a use. Okay, but so it's probably something, there's papers about that. There right? are papers, yeah. it's such a small game, it's usually not worth fretting about. Well, on the question about what lights have they got, there might be an interesting question here, that people who are more inclined to make energy savings in a shortage might already be the sort of people who have energy efficient lighting. Yes. Or they might not, Yes. but, it, but it's, it's something that could correlate yes. with, with cha changing the average. Yes. And it, but a lot of your work is pointing to don't trust the average because the distribution is interesting and that's just one more aspect of yes. the average isn't meaningful, the distribution is. 
Uh, I think the, the thing about this is that it's, I, I may, I maybe I've been quite ambitious in terms of what I could actually achieve. And when I looked into it, um, I realized there's, in order to be able to do that, there's a lot of assumptions that need to be made. And one of the biggest ones is this, is actually I needed to make an assumption as to what the average was. And you know, and, and, and that, is, that is a bit of a, there's lots of things like that, of course. But yeah. the moment you touch out what people do, it's, it, it becomes quite complex, I think, because you don't really, it, yeah, it's very complex. Um, so my comments about the previous graph is that there's very disparate impact, a lot of differences between the impacts. Um, so maybe what that means is that if we were um, telling people in such a situation to save energy, maybe we just should concentrate on telling them to do a few things rather than 25 things. And certainly we shouldn't tell them to do things like uh, wash their clothes by hand, um, because actually that doesn't save that much energy at all, you know, in terms of absolute either gas equivalent numbers, it doesn't. It actually uses a little bit more energy because you need hot water, and it's not very effective in doing that, um, I think, according to my work. <laughs> um, what, um, yes, what, as I say, there's a combined effect of whether the new action is put in place, is implemented, and the saving achievable. Um, yeah, you can't actually add up all the energy saving actions to do the estimate from my f uh, previous graph. They don't really add up, they interact too much, but um, this is a useful little graph to have. Um, this is what we just mentioned, the negative effect of electricity savings on um, gas use, which is maybe falsely represented in Britain, I should maybe have a look at that. Um, also, the gas equivalent reduces the weight of electricity because the gas content in the electricity consumption um, is about 0.8 um, kilowatt hour of gas per kilowatt hours of electricity. I've calculated in average for the year 2011. So again, you're looking and have to do the other way around. Is it yours? Can, can you say say what you think that factor is? What the ratio is between? It takes that into account um, the total um, amount of. Maybe I've got it wrong. Right? Let's, do Let's do it offline. We'll, we'll, check, we'll check after. The, but after I've this. calculated yeah. the total amount of um, uh, gas that's used per kilowatt of electricity. You know, so you know, some of the electricity is going to be com composed of nuclear power. Right. Some is imported right. from outside. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so that's why I get I get this number, because right. it's a context. I'm not. So the the thing about this approach is a different context to what I would evaluate. Say, if I was trying to evaluate a climate change situation of energy saving, where I look at CO two, and the balance would be completely the other way around. Mm. And also, if I was looking at costs, for example, in pounds, um, you know, from savings, um, pound saving, um, economical saving from different energy saving actions, also the balance would be completely different. So we change my graph there, I would have much bigger those all of the terms. Um, bigger those, like the, the green lines, that's what I mean. Um, that's it. So just a few things on um, sensitivity. I've done a lot of sensitivity work uh, recently. Um, I'm going to actually, I'm, I'm being very honest about the problems I've got because <laughs> I'd rather put them out um, before I finish writing up, I guess. Come on. Hello? No? No. <laughs> no? Oh, okay. Um, so this is my main worry. Um, this is the main thing I'm concerned about. I've, in order to evaluate the um, energy saving through eating only one room in the house uh, and or heating only the rooms which are being used in the house. I've um, decided of a temperature reduction in this room in comparison to the main uh, temperature setting in the rest of the house. Because I didn't start, think it was appropriate in view of comfort things that it wasn't appropriate to um, set it up at 3.6 degrees centigrade, which is the average January temperature according to Breedon. You'd also think it would be almost impossible. No, yes, yeah, it's not possible. Yeah. Temperature. But y the thing is that Breedon doesn't really represent that properly. If I'd done a dynamic thermal simulation, 
then that would be represented properly, but it's not. So the good thing about breeding is that it's, it's quick, you know, it does like in three seconds, uh, it does 700 houses in you know, energy saving calculation, but it has some problems. And, and this is one of them is if I reduce the temperature in these other rooms which are unheated, and I assume that they actually reach external temperature, which is not realistic, then this is what happens. I get really high energy savings, taking into account the fact that loads of people are implementing these, uh, these two particular actions. I get up to 72% savings, which is ridiculous. What, what, what are you doing the, um, in terms of assuming of, of the actual temperature as well in, in the rooms? Because my, my understanding is that there's you know, minimum recommendations to keep moulds and and such mm -hmm. a sort of at bay, and there's minimum recommendations of temperatures for elderly and yeah. for yeah. firm and blah, blah, blah. And, and my understanding was even just to keep moulds, etc. at bay, unless you're ventilating, unless you open all the windows yeah. and close all the doors should, yeah. and have external insulation on it, yeah. <laughs> effectively create a much smaller home. I've kind of, um, I haven't looked at that because I think it's a shortage situation. So for me it's a oh, crisis. Of course, of course. I crisis. think if we were in a, in a different sort of day-to-day -day basis then, um, it'd be completely different. I mean, I've taken things like um, health and safety into account when it comes to temperature of a washing machine. Where, you know, you're supposed to do a high wash in one and then, for example. Mm -hmm. No, you can't do 30 degrees all the time. Mm -hmm. But for this, um, I kind of assumed that the more growth wouldn't be a problem with the more social. Look at that. But, um, yeah, th right, this is what, if using Redem, if you reduce the temperature more and more until you actually reach the external temperature in most of the house, you get to a completely unrealistic um, saving. So this is where my assumption lies, it's about here. And, you know, I could have taken a completely different assumption, it's actually quite, you know, flexible what kind of temperature reduction is, is bound to be acceptable for people. So this is one of the issues. Um, Except that I've also, like I told you earlier, my ESA factor, energy saving action factors, have error margins around them. So I've looked at the impact of this error margin. So um, this is electricity, gas, and my measure of gas equivalent. And you can see that if I use um, the minimum energy saving action savings for each of these ESA factor, I get just under 20% savings here and the maximum savings that could be achievable is just under 50%. So it's quite a wide margin. To keep in mind that uh, my error margins, not just my ESA factors I estimate, mostly using existing research, but they're still estimates as far as I, I, I can decide, and they informed estimates, but they're estimates, and the error margins in themselves are also estimates, really. So. This is the way what happens if you try to put numbers, people in numbers. Um, I've done a Monte Carlo, I'm afraid this is only 100 runs, but I was doing this on this machine. I'm going to run it this afternoon to have a, a better shaped curve. Um, but, um, <coughs> so I've done a Monte Carlo, what this does, it takes um, a value between my maximum and minimum um, is a factor value, and, and it uses that for each run. Um, and it uses a different value for each energy saving action. So it's just to, I just wanted to look at uh, the kind of shape that would give me. And of course I get a very similar mean, which is about 33%, 32%. Um, and an error, I've got a standard deviation of um, 5 to 6% here, which means that basically 95% of my data is within um, 20 and 40% saving roughly. Now I've done another thing. I've, um, I've attributed to each household, for each energy saving action, I've uh, decided whether each household would implement it or not, randomly. So, for example, in, the term, in terms of um, heating only one room in the house, um, the idea was that only 50% I've completely, uh, again, done an informed estimate looking at my practice review, for this particular energy saving action, I, I want to have attributed an implementation factor of 
for the um, setting the temperature, internal temperature at one degree centigrade less, I've decided on 75% implementation because loads of people don't actually have a thermostat and don't actually know how to do this. But um, the point is I've attributed an implementation person, person of certain percentage and randomly decided which households within my sample would actually implement each different action through, um, and, and I've, I've done a Monte Carlo. Does that make sense, what I'm trying to explain? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've done a Monte Carlo using a combination of this particular thing, and the implementation factor, and um, the ESA factor um, being randomly assigned between its minimum and maximum value. And I looked at the distribution again. And here, what I'm expecting, again, this is my first run, there's 100 only. But what I'm expecting is a curve which is going to be a bit flatter. That's what I'll expect to come out here. This is just for experimental purposes. But um, it's a very simple uh, Monte Carlo. It's not a, a sort of a very uh, precise uh, randomization um, algorithm. It's quite a, so it's, it's just for exploration, rather. The purpose is not to explore uh, uncertainty of my work. This is just to look at the uncertainty in my work. Um, so I've looked at also sensitivity to other things. My base case thermometer setting, for example. Um, so this is here um, the percentage saving. As you can see, the um, the saving abs in absolute numbers goes up, but in percentage goes down. Um, and um, it's actually not too sensitive. I mean, you have it varies between um, about 38% to about 30% um, amount of saving, depending on my initial um, thermostat setting. So I expected a, a higher sensitivity here, and I've checked this is actually what happens more. Another thing it's not very sensitive to, I was concerned about the heating patterns, because we know that that really governs the amount of energy that's used um, in space heating. So I've looked at heating patterns. This is my base estimate, 13%. And I've used the survey heating patterns. By that, I mean I've used <coughs> um, uh, what people, pe in my survey there was a question, how many days do you spend at home? So I've used the survey heating patterns rather than the Breedham, uh, so the, the, the Breedham and SAP assumptions, and looked at how, I, how much impact that had. It does have an impact onto the overall energy use, but in terms of percentage, which is what I'm interested in, percentage saving, it doesn't have an impact overall. So I've used um, the survey heating patterns and the other thing I've changed is the uh, number of hours people were inside the house. I've put something a little bit more realistic than the assumption which is being made in Reden. And here um, again this is a calculation done with assuming that people um, heat the house whenever it's needed. They don't switch the, the heating off during the summer because I'm, I've been told that that's something I needed to test. So it works about the same so I'm not too worried about that. So, uh, yeah, I'm nearly finished. Um, so there's, my conclusion is I think there's potential, but it's only potential, it's not actually what's going to happen. This is a discussion on the potential. There's potential to save energy through rapid energy savings in households. Um, I do also think that because of uh, the nature of um, the, the, the type of work this is, um, which relates to trying to put a number of people's behavior or potential behaviors as big margins of error. But this is not, not to be expected. I think it's completely uh, kind of expected that. Um, the thing to remember that me, my work relates to um, a shortage situation. So uh, there's going to be completely different si in consideration if we're looking at the as usual situation or climate change maybe related work. And uh, this is Mr. Messi. Um, <laughs> I want to I'll just put him there because I think it's messy business. This is my discussion on my, the method I've used. It is inherently messy business, um, um, putting people in number. The other thing is I found there's a lot of areas where I just thought, oh, I wish somebody had been researching that particular point. There is not much uh, work that tries to put the link